All right, everyone, welcome back to JPC Spiritual Talk. It's Jared Campbell. So today we're going to talk about North and South Korea, Putin's global moves, Biden's bold immigration reform, rising global tensions, and a new era of geopolitics. So we're going to jump right into this. We're going to get our screen shared over. We're going to kind of wing it today a little bit, right? But I got everything kind of in place to talk about. So let's get the screen shared over. Let's get right to it because we got a lot to cover. My philosophy is to cover as much as I can, if that makes sense. So my philosophy is to cover as much as I can, right? And a good amount of time frame. So you get the most information as you possibly can. So here's the first article on the screen. So I'm going to click on this one. We're going to jump right into it. I'm going to translate this, right? I'm going to move fast, but at the same time, not too fast, right? There's some videos we'll watch. We'll watch some. I'm going to pick and choose the video so it doesn't take us too long. So what, what, what you see on the screen, it says, new front. North Korean forces attack South Korea with defense pack in place and Russian Pacific fleet in firing positions, all right? There's some videos. So here we go. So North Korean forces have attacked South Korea for the third time this month crossing the border and prompting South Korean troops to fire warning shots. The Russian North Korean defense pact exaggerates the situation, exaggerates the situation with the Russian Pacific fleet simulating a major naval confrontation near South Korea and Japan. Russian warships are conducting long range scale exercises involving 40 ships, submarines, aircrafts, and helicopters. Concurrently, the Russian Northern fleet is mobilizing, having successfully launched missiles in the Barents Sea. In response to these tensions, South Korea has summoned the Russian ambassador to explain the defense agreement between North Korea and Russia. Beautiful. So this is what this article is talking about. It's a quick rundown. All right. So there are some videos in here. We'll click on some of them. So this one, it says, watch the video of Russian naval mobilization. Right. Here's some other ones. All right. Let's move along, see what else we can see. Right. South Korean summons Russian ambassador for explanation right so there's an exercise that was carried out by the ships here so let's take a look at this one we're not going to watch all of it just wanted to show a couple of these clips before we move on to the next article right so let's close out and not spend too much time in here, right? The Russian ambassador visits South Korean foreign ministry, right? Right. So let's move on. Let's back out of here. So our next agenda. Let me translate. All right. So NATO forces on final stretch, right? U.S. to Ukraine, strike targets across Russia, down fighter jets inside Russian EEC. 
confirmation from War News 24-7, US, USA, no Americans to travel to Russia. All right. So the U.S. has expanded the use of American and NATO weapon systems to allow Ukraine to, sh- to strike targets deep within the Russian territory beyond the Kharkiv border areas and extending up to 300 kilometers into Russia. The move comes as the situation escalates with the impending arrival of F-16 fighter jets, signaling a potential final phase before NATO forces might enter Ukraine. The Pentagon confirmed that Ukraine could use U.S.-supplied weapons for self-defense against Russian forces, not, not, not just near the border, but throughout Russia, if attacked from there. National Security Advisor, listen attentively, Jake Sullivan and Defense Department spokesman, Lieutenant General Patrick Ryder empathize this policy's logic and self-defense nature. Additionally, the U.S. State Department has issued a vital travel warning advising all American citizens against traveling to Russia due to the risk of detention and imprisonment. All right, so be careful traveling to Russia is what it's saying. All right, so that's my quick objective breakdown of that article. Let's get to the video. All right, so we're going to listen to U.S. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller, and it seems like he's scaring Americans about traveling to Russia. So let's let's take a look at this. No American citizen, for any reason, should travel to Russia. And I know this is a uh, sometimes comes down to a very painful choice for Americans who have family members in Russia, sometimes family members with health problems that they want to see. But you run a tremendous risk by traveling to Russia of being detained, being imprisoned being convicted. And so we continue to make clear to every American, do not for any reason travel to Russia. All right, let's back out, let's move on. We're next in place here. All right, so our next next one here. So Ukraine, Russia, pressure on all fronts against the background of the fall of the last strongholds of Gunstead. This is what the situation on all Ukrainian fronts. So the conflict between Russia remains very intense between U- Ukraine and Russia is remaining very intense with heavy engagements and fluctuating front lines. Reports indicate 87 clashes and 523 Russian attacks across various fronts when significant activity in certain areas of the Kubiansk area. Ukraine has managed to stabilize areas near Kubiansk. Ukraine has managed to stabilize some fronts repelling attacks in certain other areas and pushing back Russian forces in other areas. The situation is critical around other areas as well, where 12 Russian offenses are ongoing. Despite stabilization on other areas of the axis, the overall pressure remains high. Russian forces are also attempting to encircle Ukrainian strongholds and other areas close to Chromosome by capturing strategic locations such as in Lehman and Uzium, crucial for Ukrainian supply lines with mixed successes. Russian operations continue across various regions, including Kharkiv, Longis, and also Dunstans. Despite the extensive use of drones and artillery, Russia has not yet, has not yet established a force capable of challenging NATO conventionally, leading to questions about its military strategy and effectiveness. The conflict continues to see high casualties and significant destruction on both sides, with both sides struggling what for control. My objective breakdown of the article, all right? So the links are in the description box if you want to look at all these areas. Like I said, I kind of kept that simple because we got to move on. We have a lot to cover, okay? So here we go. Our next one on the chopping block. So we're gonna translate this. I'm gonna kind of move down this article and you're gonna look at a map, right? For starters, as I kind of zoom in on this map, okay? So I'm gonna kind of break this one down. You will see at the bottom, they will cut into the Ukrainian forces. So just kind of look at this map. So Russian forces have launched a significant offensive on the Kubian subtotal axis, aiming to split the Ukrainian army in two and reach the Oskol River. They have assembled a strike punch of 10,000 troops with tanks, artillery, and aerial support. 
The operation targets breaking through Ukrainian defenses in certain areas that, that, that will make the Russians advance to Oscar River, with consecration attacks from other areas also. Russian forces have already captured the strategic areas Right here, this, those are the areas the Ukrainians have lost right there on your screen. I ain't trying to keep up with myself here. Ukrainian units have retreated westward after intense Russian artillery and air force attacks. Also, the Ukrainian general staff reports ongoing Russian attacks near, find it on my screen. see here let me find it on my screen but you guys click on the link okay so the russians are trying to encircle the ukrainian army and they're trying to split it in two or i couldn't find some of it on my screen but let me get back to what i was saying so the ukrainian general staff reports ongoing russian attacks all right with additional assaults underway the russians also destroyed a key bridge over the Oscar river cutting off ukrainian supply lines to forces west of Sabatoa and Crimea. This concentrated offensive poses a significant challenge to Ukrainian defenses, potentially altering control dynamics that are in the region, All right? Let's see what type of videos we have here. Some of these have music, so I don't want to play a lot of them, but definitely don't want to get a strike. So, video destroyed. Alpha Sierra 90 self propelled howitzer, Ukrainian armed forces, UAV pilot blown up, attack on Ukrainian team trench. <clears throat> all right well, let's back out let's continue to move forward since we do have a lot to cover so here's our our next play let's get it translated and we'll get going all right so here we go so it says satellite images of china's shipyards worry the u.s plan hellscape is our only hope to save Taiwan. What the Americans saw and worry, China, your plan will fail. So China's saying that the plan that they have will fail. So let's kind of break this article down, right? So reach, reach, okay, I'm sorry. Recent satellite images of China's shipyards have raised concerns within the U.S. military, particularly regarding China's massive shipbuilding capacity, which is reported 232 times greater than that of the U.S., in Jangahan Shipyard in Shanghai alone, 13 large surface ships, including helicopter carriers, destroyers, frigates, and Coast Guard vessels are under construction. This rapid expansion highlights China's increasing naval capabilities and strategic advancements, advancements such as developing an innovative Type 076 helicopter carrier with electromagnetic catapults for VTOL aircraft and large drones. In response, the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command have advised a contingency plan known as Plan Hellscape to, to counter a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Admiral Samuel Paparo, the head, the head of Indo, the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, outlined the strategy which involves deploying thousands of drones to create a drone hell in the, in the Taiwan Straits. 
aiming to delay and disrupt Chinese military operations until reinforcements will arrive. The plan seeks to prevent a quick but decisive Chinese victory and ensure the U.S. and its allies can effectively respond to the threat. However, this plan is associated with significant challenges and also some uncertainties. The U.S. can currently lack a reliable defense against China's hypersonic missiles and delays in delivering and delivering necessary military systems to allies like Japan further complicate the situation. Chinese officials have dismissed the U.S. plan, asserting that the plan will fail. If the U.S. drone swarms are not ready in time, it could result in a prolonged conflict with severe casualties for the U.S. and its allies. That was my objective summary of the article. So let's kind of scroll through this. Right? So here's a picture, right? The total displacement will exceed 40,000 tons, right? So here's a picture. So this is what's under construction there in that shipyard in Shanghai, right? We'll kind of zoom in, right? Interesting. Okay, quick picture. Let's scroll through here and see else what we have. So here's a video. Latest developments now from the Taiwan Strait with tensions high as ever in Taiwan, top U.S. Admiral of uh, the Navy fleet in the Indo-Pacific has threatened to turn the Taiwan Strait into an unmanned hellscape in the event of China invading Taiwan. The U.S. maintains strategic ambiguity when it comes to the recognition of Taiwan. However, it has been a vocal supporter of Taiwan in recent years. Admiral Samuel Paparo, the commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, has said, I want the turn. I want to turn the Taiwan Strait into an unmanned hellscape using a number of classified capabilities. He also said, and I quote here again, I can make their lives utterly miserable for a month, which buys me the time for the rest of everything. End of quote. Now, as per Admiral Samuel, the plan would involve deploying thousands of unmanned systems, including surface vessels, submarines and aerial drones to confront Chinese invading forces as they cross the Taiwan Strait, serving as initial line of defense. This strategy necessitates significant investment in affordable and reliable drones, which is a focus of the U.S. Replicator Initiative. The Department of Defense announced this program last year, aiming to deploy thousands of autonomous systems. Though progress on this ambitious plan has been relatively quiet, there have been signs of advancement. In March, the Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks announced that the Pentagon plans to allocate $1 billion this fiscal year to the replicator. The Pentagon is collaborating with defense partners to develop and acquire the necessary systems for the first drones in the program. The aim of the replicator is to counter China's numerical su uh, superiority by deploying a massive amount of drones that are harder to predict, target and defeat. I'll start with what we all know to be true is that uh, the world is increasingly descending into chaos and disorder. And from Europe to the Middle East to the Pacific, we're seeing significant shifts in state behaviors, and they are not random. At a recent. All right, Paul, just a second. Catch the words. The world is descending into what? chaos right destruction and chaos remember i'm a bible guy I study theology right during the end times the world will be forced into complete chaos resulting in a savior right well the messiah has already come what's next the antichrist i just want to point that out right state visit to moscow to the, words. the prc president i won't utter his name was overheard telling the russian president Right now, there are changes, the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years, and we are the ones driving those changes together. The changes referenced are a challenge to our security, our freedom, and our well-being. We're seeing a world that's increasingly moving from adhering to rules to prizing national power, from focusing on economic development 
to emphasizing national security and from relying on market efficiencies to de developing and building national resiliency. Recognizing this disorder, our national uh, security strategy highlights that we are in the midst of a strategic competition to shape the future of the international order. I think that video is too long to play. I think it was a longer video. All right, so let's back out. Let's continue to roll through this. So here we go. We'll get this one loaded up, translated, and we'll get on our way. All right? You all can't be following. So here we go. So bad news for Ukraine, right? Russia drops. Bob, 3,000. M54 beast bomb with UMPK for the first time. Kiev casualties in 24 hours succeed 2100, right? So game changer, the most powerful wind kit bomb. Ooh. So the Russian Air Force has used a FOB 3000 M54 Beast bomb with UMPK guidance kit for the first time, targeting a Ukrainian base in Kharkiv. This powerful three-ton bomb is seen as what a game changer. Due to its ability to destroy extensive fortification and underground command posts, this successful deployment resulted in significant damage with a deviation of only 10 meters from the target, demonstrating high precision and such a giant bomb. In the last 24 hours, Ukrainian casualties have, have succeeded 2,100. 2,165 to be exact, according to the article. According to the Russian Ministry of Defense, so according to the Russian Ministry of Defense, right, according to them, not me, their words, not mine. This surge in casualties is attributed to a large-scale Russian attack on Ukrainian energy facilities and military targets in response to Ukrainian attempts to damage, to damage Russian energy infrastructure. We've talked about that before in some of my videos. These attacks included strikes on various Ukrainian brigades in the Kharkiv region, resulting in a lot resulting in the loss of personnel, vehicles, and also and artillery. Fierce fighting will continue in the Kharkiv regions, particular around areas like Lipchi. Ukrainian forces are attempting, attempting counterattacks but are facing heavy resistance and significant losses. Russian troops have advanced and entrenched themselves in new positions, okay? Further complicating the situation for the Ukrainian forces, right? Objective summary of that article. Let's look at some videos. It's videos in this article. Okay. So here we go. The first use of that bomb. All right. So we're going to make sure it's muted. We're going to watch them drop that beast of a bomb. Right. What they use on Ukrainian forces. Close out. All right, so we saw that. Oh, it's been too much time in here, right? We saw that video. Well, let's back out. Let's continue our role here, right? So we'll continue our role. Let's translate some of this here. So. Find the article here. All right. Let me move out. Give me just bear with me a second. Let me pull up my notes so I can get to that article. You guys can just look at my notes here. 
the conflict we talk there. There. Yeah. All that. This link right here. All right. Now I'm tracking. Yep. May have to do that for the others, but we're good. Bear with me. Here we go, man. All right. So it says Putin. The West, so this is what Putin is claiming, right? So Putin says the West will overthrow Z Zelensky in the first half of 2025. Russia changes nuclear doctrine due to U.S. and NATO. The euro Atlantic security system is collapsing. So President Putin made a significant statements during, so the Russian President Putin made significant statements during a press conference following his visit to Vietnam. He predicted that the West would overthrow Ukrainian President Zelensky in the first half of 2025, based on intelligence from the Russian Foreign Intelligence Services. Putin suggested that the West would use Zelensky as a scapegoat for unpopular decisions before placing him likely, replacing him with likely Z Zaluni, Z Zalunini, I said that right, the former head of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Putin also discussed the, the anticipation the antithesis, the anticipated adverse reaction to Russia's peace plan for Ukraine, stating that negotiations should happen immediately if Kiev does not demand the withdrawal of Russian troops. He advised that the Euro Atlantic security system needs to improve. He claimed that the West continued to pursue a strategic defeat for Russia, which would mark the end of the Russian state. In response to perceived threats from NATO and the U.S., Russia plans to revise its nuclear doctrine to lower the threshold for nuclear weapon use. However, Putin clarified that Russia does not currently need a preemptive strike. He also criticized Western pressure on, on Ukraine to achieve military success in Kharkiv and condemned the inhu inhumane sanctions against North Korea, comparing them to the blockade of Leningrad. Additionally, Putin noticed NATO's increasing presence in Asia, in Asia as a security threat requiring a response from Russia, though denied seeking North Korea assistance in the conflict with Ukraine. wasn't much in this one other than that was the summary of what that article said go back out to my notes Let's see here. so now he visited right here copy Bear with me, I had to do this, so. All right. I'll translate. All right, here we go. So during his visit, so during Putin's visit to Vietnam, Putin emphasized that strengthening strategic ties with Vietnam was a priority. He and, the, he and the Vietnamese president discussed expanding energy investments and creating nu a nuclear center in Hanoi. <laughs> Listen attentively. The two leaders signed 11 agreements covering various sectors, including oil, gas, atomic science, and education. Putin's visit, however, sparked criticism from Vietnam's Western partners, including the U.S. and the EU who opposed giving Putin a platform and the ongoing war in Ukraine. The visit followed a mutual defense agreement signed between Russia and North Korea to enhance security in the Asia Pacific region. All right. So things are definitely heating up. All right. Let's go through some of these videos and see which one was it. I think it's going to be this one. Вот вы сейчас говорили о русской истории, о русской культуре, yes, но это тоже область знаний. Русская литература, искусство в широком смысле этого слова – это часть мировой культуры. 
и, конечно, для того, чтобы ориентироваться в, в целом вот, в достижениях, в том, что достигнуто человечеством в этой сфере, в области культуры, конечно, знание русской культуры весьма значительным является. Но само по себе владение русским языком дает возможность открыть не только русскую душу и, и русское искусство, но и использовать его для получения соответствующих знаний, что и вы делали, и делают 3000 человек, сейчас обучающиеся в России, и 75 тысяч, которые закончили вузы Российской Федерации и Советского Союза, и часть из них находится здесь. Но нужно выбирать те направления, которые представляют для вас наибольший интерес. Вот я уже говорил о том, чем мы занимаемся да, в России, что мы считаем перспективными. Но это только, только то, что вот прямо в голову пришло. Для того, чтобы добиваться результатов по всем этим направлениям, мы, например, активно будем заниматься и занимаемся развитием искусственного интеллекта. И добились очень неплохих результатов, хочу вам сказать. У нас есть компании такие, как Яндекс, такие, как Сбер, которые являются, безусловно, добиваются лидерских позиций. Ну или, например, безусловным лидером в области таких, таких инноваций, как как исследование в области ядерных технологий. Я сейчас еще два слова скажу о Росатоме. Но это реально лидерские позиции в мире. Он таких разработок, как в России, практически нет ни в одной стране мира. Это перспективные или нет? Да, это очень перспективно с точки зрения теоретической физики, ядерной физики. И вот мы сейчас только что запускали в одном из наших наукоградов, о, которых, о котором я сказал, мирового класса, установку, которая исследует, исследует вопросы, связанные с началом жизни нашей Вселенной. So let's uh, back out. Let me go back to my notes now. Because now I'm going to, we're almost finished. So the last little bit here. Copy, come back, all right. It's in here. Here we go. There it is. May have to fix that link later in the notes. I'll definitely do that. So Putin's stern warning to South Korea. Don't make the big mistake with Ukraine. You won't like the answer. I hope you don't make the mistake. So the Russian president, Putin, He issued a stern warning to South Korea, advising against supplying weapons to Ukraine. This warning came after Putin visited Pyongyang in North Korea, where Russia and North Korea signed a mutual defense cooperation pact. South Korea has indicated it might consider supplying arms to Ukraine if North Korea-Russia deal proceeded. Putin reassured that Seoul had nothing to worry about regarding the defense agreement with Pyongyang, but cautioned that South Korea would not like Russia's response if it made the big mistake of arming Ukrainians. Russian state media underscored that Mos Moscow's cooperation with Pyongyang reacted to Western actions. All right, so we can see it pretty much heating up. Okay, I don't know if this video is translated or not. В, uh, it may not uh, be. В зону боевых действий на Украину, то это было бы очень большой ошибкой. Надеюсь, что этого не произойдет. Если это будет происходить, то тогда и мы тоже будем принимать соответствующие решения, которые вряд ли понравятся сегодняшнему руководству Южной Кореи. Что? Okay. So there Putin threatened South Korea. Basically, he said if South Korea supplies weapons to Ukraine, it will not like the answer. I hope they won't do it it would be a big mistake. So that's what he was saying, right? So we're almost done now. Our last but not least article, we're going to close out. So I hope you've all enjoyed this. I've covered as much as I can today. I can 
find it. Let's go back to my notes here. Bear with me, we're almost done. We're gonna talk. Where is it at? Here we go. Hopefully this link works. All right. So a problem for Trump, the USA, Biden gives citizenship to 500,000 foreigners. Trump, he said, this illegal amnesty bill will be torn up and thrown away. So President Joe Biden announced his new initiative to grant U U.S. citizenship to approximately 500,000 immigrants married to American citizens, sparking criticism from the former president, Donald, Donald Trump. Biden improvised a balance between secu securing the border and providing legal immigration pathways, criticizing Trump's harsh rhetoric on immigrants. The new policy allows spouses of the U.S. citizens who have lived in the U.S. for at least 10 years to apply for citizenship without leaving the country, benefiting around 500,000 spouses and 50,000 children. The ACLU praised the move, while Trump vowed to repeal the measure if reelected, arguing it would increase crime and strain further U.S. resources. That's it. Hey, guys. What do you guys think? Right. My opinion really doesn't matter. I'm upset with my government. Right. I think everything is crazy right now. And I do not understand what's going on. But my job is to keep you all informed. And I have done that today. So we're going to close out because I covered as much as I can in this video. Went way longer than I expected. So we're going to close out. Right. Thank you all again for following. I hope you enjoyed. Right. How I put it all together. Continue to like, subscribe, and share if you want to. Thank you all again for following. Let me know what I can do different, right, so I can work on that, right, cover other things as well. Thank you all so much for following. I'm out.